Interruptions podcast, where we have heartfelt and sacred discussions about topics around our faith, family traditions, and community. We invite guests who are open and willing to share their journey and disrupt the silence on their personal interruptions that have impacted their lives. Kathy and I are passionate about every episode and committed to providing actionable advice that you can apply today to reinvent yourself and to know that you are not alone. This month is Black History Month, and I am one of your co-hosts. I'm Reverend Odell. And I'm Kathy Patton, and welcome to our podcast. Welcome. Odell, I'm really excited. Um, Our podcast is being recorded in the first week of Black History Month, so that means we can celebrate all month. Um, So I'm really excited about that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm particularly excited about our guest tonight, but before we bring him in, um, so much going on right now, right? Oh, the politics. Yes. It there is. Uh, I was watching the news this morning, and they were talking about the NFL. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you heard that or not, but the NFL had was the there was a discrepancy on who they gave um, support. I mean, medical support to based on their demographics. And not all the players received equal pay for injuries. So that's going to be aired tonight. And as they were trying to get some information, the NFL would not reveal this information. And Uh, it's it's sad. That is sad. And 70 percent of the players in the NFL are African-American. And today they're saying that uh, their families don't receive equal pay for injuries. Wow. Wow. No, I had not heard that. Knew that from history, but had not heard that go bring, being brought up yet again about something that we kind of already knew, yes. which makes it um, really exciting about our guest that's coming on this evening. Um, you know, one of the things, Odell, that you and I talk about a lot is it's in politics. We hear just as we are still so very excited about our vice president, Kamala Harris, but yes, that she are. is the first African-American woman to be vice president. And um, what do you think about that, that we're still, this is 2021 and we're still yep. saying the first. How do you feel about that? It's sad. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 it's sad in our history that, you know, we've had 46 presidential elections. And even with this cabinet, there are many first. And that's sad. Mm -hmm. And there's always an issue and and it's always an issue. And I mean, it's I'm glad that someone's breaking the glass ceiling and someone is the first. But I would like it when we no longer have to say that they are the first, that they are the first. Absolutely. There is a pattern. Yes. Which makes it even more um, fitting that our guest tonight is Gary Holder Winfield, who is a Connecticut state senator for the Democratic Party. Yes, yes. Love that Democratic Party. <laughs> <laughs> I love, love to hear Senator. Love to hear Senator in front of his name, right? Yes. W- welcome, Gary. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yes, welcome. Gary, to you know, world. it was exciting when Odell and I, we discussed who we're bringing on the podcast, and, and we knew that because there's so much going on in politics this year, always going on, right, but particularly this year, that we, it, it just was a natural for us to call on you. And I don't know if you could hear us when you were in the background, but we were having a, a brief conversation about uh, how we feel about still hearing the word first. Yeah. when someone of color now is um, appointed or elected to an official position. How does how do you feel about that? Uh, much the way that you all uh, were indicating you felt, um, but also it makes me immediately start to think about um, the importance of the first, but I'm still waiting to hear about the second. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's that, that's kind of a joke, but it's not, right? You know, the mm-hmm. first the first can just be signifying, but what what makes it meaningful is the second and the third and the fourth. So uh, I'm waiting on that and and doing my part to help others be uh, the second, third, and fourth. Right. So, Gary, uh, you have you hold the position of chief deputy majority leader. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Can you just explain to us exactly what that is? 
Uh, so we have a majority leader who is, as you know, the leader of the, the majority party in, in our state, that's the Democrats. Um, and then he has a, a group of people who are his um, deputies. They do all kinds of tasks. Uh, I'm the most senior amongst that group of, uh, of deputies. I um, screen the bills. I um, do a lot of uh, the work to help the majority leader run the party. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Yeah, we see the title is very impressive. And some of our guests were like, well, what does he actually do? You yeah, know? That, that's one of many tasks. <laughs> that's, that's one of many tasks, oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were able to be on Interruptions. And I was talking to your brother-in-law, Damar, and told him that you were on. <laughs> um, not sure if you had the opportunity to see interruptions when it was online. It, it aired in August. And that's how this whole interruptions got started. Were you able to see the production? I'm sorry, I missed that. I'm sorry, I got little kids in the house. <laughs> oh. Oh. They don't they don't want to cooperate. Listen, I'm sorry. we know that's family. That's okay. Yeah. I said I had the opportunity of talking to your brother-in-law, Damar, oh. and I was telling him that you were going to be on our show. Yeah. <laughs> and he was in the production interruptions. And I was wondering if you had an opportunity to see it. It was um aired in August of last year. I didn't have the opportunity to see it. I've been, <laughs> I've been jammed up. As you probably know, we did the police accountability bill, but I immediately yes. um, got into working on some of the stuff that we're working on in the session. I, I haven't, I miss, a, I miss whole parts of our lives uh, working on this stuff. So I, unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to see that yet. Well, it is still on our YouTube page. Um, it's there. And of course you were, you know about my story of losing my son. I, re I remember yeah. once summer, I'm not sure, I think it was that summer after he, he was murdered mm -hmm. that I was at a park in Hamden and I was being a big girl and walking yeah. through the park and all of a sudden these ladies and their, the, the mothers of homicide approached me and Kathy, they had their son's pictures on their shirts they had buttons they had balloons they had tattoos and they were coming to greet me to console me you know to welcome me to their section and i had a trigger it was a meltdown for me and i just started crying and i just kept walking and there gary was he was standing there and he ushered me away sat me down and just breathed and just talked you know it's People mean well, they like to help, but sometimes it's overload. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I remember you being there. So thank you. I was, I was fortunate to be able to be there. Um, you know, sometimes we want to say the right thing. We want to do the right thing. Sometimes the right thing is just to let you be. And, and I was, you don't have to thank me because I was fortunate to be able to be there for you. Thank you. Gary, in our in our podcast, I love asking this question. Um, we we talk about how in our life we we have plans, right? And then all of a sudden, <laughs> see, he gets it already. He gets it already. Gets, that question, already. Right? I know. Well, I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, <laughs> we have plans, and and the, the larger part of of what we talk about is that you know, as especially as women, when we when we were growing up, it was you know there were expectations. You go to college. Um, once you graduate college, you get a great job, you get married and you settle down and you have the 2.5 children with the house and the white picket fence. And so I know for you that you did go to college and you graduated with a, a degree in political science. However, uh, when you graduated college, you took on positions as an electrical construction manager for a power plant in Milford. And then as a field advisor for Austin Power Incorporated. Um, but then you left those positions to serve your community as a community activist. What prompted, I, I, although you did go to school for political science, what prompted that pivot in your life? And really, what was the reaction? I, I want to say feedback, but I'm going to say reaction. <laughs> what was the reaction from your inner circle, from your family, from those around you when you did that? 
so so let me first say that the, the timing on that's a little um, off, but it's important because um, my life is a constant reminder that my plans have nothing to do with what's going to happen. So uh, I grew up in a in a, a, a housing project in the, in the Bronx, and my mother was very much about school. Right, you have to go to school, you have to get good grades. I would get punished if I got a B. Right, <laughs> um, <laughs> and so. Everybody knew, because that's what I did my whole way through, which was to be at or near the top of the class, that I was going to go to college, even though no one else around me had gone. Um, and so when it was graduation time, I sat uh, with, I didn't do any fallback schools. I sat with seven acceptances out of the eight I applied to, right? So I should be going to college, but we had this mix up where my financial aid didn't ever go where it was supposed to go and I couldn't afford to go, even though I was accepted. So life threw me a curve. I'm supposed to be going to college, but I'm not, and I'm going to work. Uh, and then I found myself um, in the United States Navy. And when I was in the Navy, I was in the Navy's nuclear power program, which is not where I expected to be. And that's how I got into the engineering stuff. So what happened was I left the Navy uh, and I joined a company called ABB, which later became Alstom Power. Uh, ABB is what brought me to Connecticut. And so I'm working as an engineer uh, on the power plant that went up two decades ago. Uh, and I'm doing really well, actually. I'm, I'm saving the company all kinds of money and so much so that they reimagined what they wanted me to be. They wanted me to go to Arkansas uh, and fix some broken power plants out there. Well, uh, my first wife wasn't going to Arkansas. And so if she wasn't going, I wasn't going, right? So that gave me the opportunity. I call it an opportunity now. That gave me the opportunity to leave doing that. And I decided, I can live for a while. I made a lot of money. I can live for a while. Let me go back to school and learn something else. And what I wanted to do when I got to New Haven, because I'd taken a walk around the community and saw things I didn't like and wanted to be involved, but doing that job 14, 15 hours a day, I couldn't do it. Now I had time. And so I said, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to study political science, and I'm going to get involved in the things going on in the community. And my parents, my mom, and my sister and brother and everybody's like, you gonna give up all that money and all that to go do what? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go try to help people. Um, so I went to school, and um, life has just continued to to throw me curveballs all the way through. And, and that's what life does. And I think if you if you're listening, uh, life is actually telling you where to go. But sometimes it has to throw you major curveballs because you're not listening. Major. Major. So you went from I and we heard you as Kathy and I were looking at your background and we're like, that's a big drop in money. <laughs> Huge. <laughs> and we could see your face go, mm, yes, yes, yes. Huge but financial I, I, interruption. I but can I say no. something that I think is important? And some people are gonna think this is mystical mumbo jumbo, but I think it's important. It worked in my life. When I when I listened. Um, and I was in a space where I wasn't making the money that I was making and not making the money that I needed to make in order to make things meet, match up. Somehow it just still worked. And that, that's, that, that is something that I've discovered when I'm listening, when I'm connected. Uh, I, I believe in God, but some people believe in a source. When I'm connected, things are working. And I can't even really explain how they're working. Mm hmm. Uh, you just said it, faith. I was going to ask you, yes. are you a person of faith? Because, you know, you say, I was, I'm, I'm listening to, like, who are you listening to? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, when um, I say I can't explain, I mean, I can't actually articulate to people how it is. I, I, I have a sense of what it is, yes. That's it. It's just, it's, it's hearing that voice and the comfort in your soul and knowing that this is the right thing to do and this is the path that we're on. I mm -hmm. truly understand. So when you saw the community, what year was this, Gary? I arrived here in 2000 or 2001. I can't remember. It, it began, oh. They kind of mashed together. Not far. Okay. Yeah, not too far. Two decades ago. Oh, I guess it's 2021. Yes. And what did you see that you didn't like? Uh, so I, I, what I normally do, well, I don't plan to move anymore, but when I used to <laughs> move, uh, I would walk around the community and get a sense of it. And, um, for me, when I walked around, I could I knew who lived in what community just by the way the communities looked. Um, mm -hmm. You know, remember at that time downtown didn't look as good as it looks now. Um, some of our neighborhoods look different. 
uh, where I live at Winchester and Division, right across the street, was not the beautiful science park that it is now. It was mostly rubble, and you, you know, so uh, mm -hmm. the, it was clear to me that certain people lived here and certain people lived there, and you can see some of that even now. But it's not as stark, um, and I think the the stark nature of what it what it was at the time made me say, I don't. I, I don't know why this is. Why is it like this? And I don't like that it is. And I want to be a part of doing something about it. Okay. Gary, um, I remember a while ago, a couple of years ago, you were running for mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you shifted and mm -hmm. ran for a state senator. Mm -hmm. um, why the shift? C can you tell yeah. us about the shift? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, to that was the 2013 race. And in the prior race, I had watched um, Jeffrey Karikas uh, run and do really, really well against the mayor. And I had been a person who my activism had brought me into conflict with the mayor many times over. Um, and I, I believe that his time had run its course. And having watched that prior race, I knew that if uh, someone who people recognize ran, they could win. Um, and I thought the city needed a new course. So that's what I endeavored to do. Uh, and I started, many people don't even realize this, I started working on that the, the year before the election took place. Uh, well, we get into the election um, and then other people show up. The first was uh, Justin Alicar, our present mayor, uh, and then uh, Saka Zulu and, and many others. And then finally, uh, Tony Harp uh, got into the race. And what I discovered as I went around was a lot of people were like, I don't want to get in between the two of you, <laughs> right? They were like, I don't want to get in between the two of you. It's uncomfortable for me. And as I watched that, I said, I think if the two of us stay in this race, a lot of people are just going to be like, I, I, and I don't think that's good for um, the community, both the community at large and the mm -hmm. community we speak of sometimes when we talk about the beloved community. So I, I made the decision that, I wasn't running because my goal in life was to be the mayor. I was running because I thought the city needed a, a different direction. So I pulled out of the race uh, and backed uh, uh, former Mayor Hart. Okay. Okay. Very selfless. And thank you for sharing that information with us. I'm really, uh, obviously, we're interested in the legis legislative work that you're doing. Um, in 2018, you had two pro high profile House bills, one Bill 380, which prohibits law enforcement from firing at a motor vehicle unless there's an imminent threat. And so I want to hold on to that one. But then as well, Senate Bill 880, which increases the transparency by uh, requiring the state to collect, report, and publish information about prosecutors' decisions on public website each year. Both of those bills, as I as I read them, and the first one, uh, the 380, the award stood out to me imminent. And then in the second one, increases. So those seem to be um, really key words in those bills. So uh, can you just share with us what I mean, how far does that mean you can only go so far or you want it to go farther? So can you share with us? So um, I think, so 380, the police bill, um, and, and I say this about the bill we just passed the, uh, in 2020 as well. There are a series of bills that I think people uh, should look at if they wanna know what we've done on police reform in, in Connecticut. So in 2015, uh, I passed uh, what was the first of its time for us, uh, multi-section, huge police accountability bill. That's where we first got the body cameras uh, and uh, the diversification of police departments. And uh, if police officers uh, commit certain acts, they can't go to another department and um, work instead of being in a department they're in. Um, and then immediately started working on more, right? I'm, I'm greedy in that way, I guess. Uh, <laughs> And we made another attempt in 2017 that failed. And then in 2018, uh, we made an attempt in 2019. And what we did was, so over the course from 2015 to last year, when we passed the big police accountability bill that everyone talks about, uh, we passed three bills, three significant bills. Um, and if the question is uh, limitations on us in terms of what we can do, there are no limitations except what can we get passed. Uh, you know, the legislature is a powerful entity. 
it, it sometimes chooses not to be powerful. And I will say oftentimes where it chooses not to be powerful is, is in the fight for justice. Um, but we are powerful and, and should we want to do a thing? Um, and <laughs> that's always a question, but should we want to do it, then we can do it. Um, and I was fighting very much to make sure that uh, Connecticut um, was doing what it needed to do for police accountability. Because I'm, I'm, I'm black, I walk around in this skin and people don't always go, that's Senator Winfield. They go, that's some black guy, right? Um, and so I know what it is to have experiences with the police. And I will tell you that as I started doing this work, um, you would think given my role, I've, all, I've been in the leadership of the, the Committee of Cognitive for a while, even before I chaired it. You would think that given my role, um, the smart course of action would be not to engage with me in certain ways. Well, the ways that you would think that I would not be engaged with are exactly how I've been engaged with, uh, both by police and people who uh, just don't like the work that I'm doing. So it's important work and um, plan on doing a lot more of it. You know, Gary, I like the fact that you said, I, and I'm a black man, but I'm, but you still have these issues that you come across regardless of the role that you have. And how do you, how do you balance that? How do you respond? Do you respond as the senator or do you respond as the black man? Yes, the senator is a black man. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I um, use the experience to show people. Um, I, I, I tell stories. So um, I tell stories in such a way that I try to give uh, texture to the things I'm talking about so that it's not just me reciting a set of facts or uh, saying, did you know, and, and that kind of thing. I, I really like to take people into the experience. So the first, one of the first experiences I had in the General Assembly when I was in the House was on a, a panel talking about education and everybody's talking and I'm just listening and I'm like, this is not real. This is not what we, what we experience. And so just to help them understand why they were talking about the achievement gap, to help them understand why it didn't sit with me the way it sat with them. I said, let me explain to you a five minute experience I had when I was a child to go do my homework. And uh, because I was in a housing project, it mm -hmm. would start in the lobby of the project. And uh, in order to get to my door, to open the door, to do the homework, uh, I had to go up the elevator or the stairs. And the elevator never, almost never had lights. It was a, it was a celebration if it had lights. Um, mm. And it would often have human urine in it and sometimes feces. And you worry about the elevator making it to, I lived on the 10th floor, apartment 10 gen. You worry about it making to the 10th floor. And even if it made it to the 10th, to the 10th floor, you worry about somebody actually riding on top of the elevator looking for a victim. And the stairs were pretty much the same situation. And I would say that I said, to them, I was like, you would walk into your door. And I had to go through that just to get to the door to start the homework. And that's only five minutes. If I told you the rest of the day, you probably asked me, how could I do it? And you know what the, the woman I was speaking to said? She said, well, how did you do it? And I said, well, if you don't understand that, how are you talking about what you call the achievement gap? Because you truly don't understand it then. And so because I'm black and I choose to be uh, a person who's not just angry about the situation, and trust me, I am, right? But who who knows that there are things I know that others don't know, and I can bring those into the conversation. I think it is helpful. Um, I think it is pertinent. And, you know, look, I chose this life, and I didn't choose this life to, to fail on policy because people don't understand it. So I have to make them understand what it is we're talking about. That's a powerful statement. That's, mm -hmm. that's a powerful statement. I don't know if you remember. You probably do. A couple of years, many years ago, um, Jesse Jackson was running for president. He was in New York. You know what I'm getting ready to say. He was running for president and he made a comment that he thought he wasn't on the mic. And he yeah. made a comment about yeah. the Jewish population. A black reporter heard it and reported it. So it went live. And mm -hmm. of course, that comment ended his political career. So the conversation that tend to happen in the community was, was this reporter a black man first, then a reporter, or was he a reporter who was a black man? And how do you respond in your community to support your community? And it sounds like what you're in, conversations that you're in and debates that you're in 
at legislator is just that. And yeah. and how often do people, how often do you have to decide, you know, who am I speaking up as? Is it the black man have this voice or does the senator have this voice? I don't, I don't decide it like that. Um, there have been black people in the Senate, there have been black people in the House, but largely black people haven't gone where I've, I've gone. And, and so everywhere I go, my, my blackness expressly comes with me. Um, and look, people don't like that so much, right? <laughs> um, but that's okay. Uh, because that's how I choose to do this. And, and you know, we, we've been talking recently about um, the stuff going on in politics and the craziness down in Washington, D.C. and the, the, the attacks and the death threats. I've lived that my whole political career because I choose to uh, do this. But it has, not, it, it, it has not stopped anything. And I think what's happened is people who are in the space just kind of know, well, that's who's coming to, to, to meet with us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you walk into my office at the Capitol, I have a red, black, and green flag, right? <laughs> that's just, it's who I am. Why would I not be it? And I, I've seen people come in and, you know, it's, it's a momentary thing because they're professionals, but you can see the break in the facade when they see that, like, what, what, what is that? Um, but I have an American flag and a red, black, and green flag because okay. both are part of who I am. And, and I cannot walk in the room as anything other than that. And Gary, that is why you were on our show for Black History Month. <laughs> and, we, and we knew that. That's we right. knew that. We just need That's people right. to hear that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we knew that. Now, another interruption. Black Lives Matter happened mm -hmm. overnight. Not overnight, but it blew up overnight. And it impacted this city in this state like I have never seen before. Uh -huh. Marches, um, marches and complaints with Hamden, Yale, um, the mayor, um, all over. And it shut down politics and politics had to shift overnight. Can you talk about the, the, the impact that it had on you as, as you say, the black man, but you, the black man, uh -huh. the senator, the dad, you know, yeah. yourself, the brother, how did that, and talk about your, that story with us, please. Yeah, I think um, my story is maybe a little different because I've never really divorced myself from the activist community. Um, I haven't reformed myself yet. Um, and so I, I think back to prior to Black Lives Matter, some of the groups that, that have been around, Dream Defenders and others uh, that we tend to forget about, uh, even here in, in, in um, you know, the, the city of New Haven, right? Some of the work that, uh, you know, Barbara Fair has done over the years. And, um, you know, I used to actually be out there with her. Um, and um, I remember standing on the courthouse steps in the, like rain and snow. Um, that stuff is critical to getting the work done. Um, but it's not just that it happens, not just that people are protesting or, or or speaking up is that there, I think there needs to be a connection between those who are inside and those who are outside. And that's, that's, that's part of the role that I think I, I'm playing now. So I never stopped talking to uh, the young people who are activists. And I've been, I've been, I started my activism at 18. I'm about to turn 47. That's 29 years, right? That's, mm -hmm. there are not many people who have been consistently active for that long. And so I've learned a couple of things. And what I, try to do with them is say, look, I don't, you do what you want to do. That's, I would never tell you what to do, but there's some things I know and I will give you anything you want to know. And I think it has been, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. My, my screen blipped for a second. I think <laughs> it has been extremely helpful to some of them. Uh, and, and some of them have even uh, gotten into politics. Um, and they never thought they were going to be in politics, just like I never thought I was going to be in politics. But on the, the issue of Black Lives Matter, I think that the, the, the fact that it's called Black Lives Matter is important. I, I think the fact that the young people are bold and they assert that they are human, right? Like they, mm -hmm. they are walking around with the Black Lives Matter the same as I am a man, right? Those signs. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think that's important because 
too many people for too long have been concerned, but not open about what they're saying, right? Like they talk about this thing as if it's almost some other thing in some other space going on. But look, we're talking about white supremacy and and we're not gonna uh, pull back from that because people are uncomfortable. We're talking, well, let me put it this way. One of my favorite people to read is James Baldwin. And I love the, I love how James Baldwin understands time or the loss of time more accurately. Um, his people didn't get their time back. My mother is dead. She's not getting that time back when we fix things, if we ever do, right? Mm -hmm. We're losing time. So while people are telling us about how to do this and how to be patient and how to get through the structure and all of that, some of that's important to winning, to getting the victories, but they need to understand that what I'm experiencing is that loss of time that my mother, my great-grandmother, my great-great-grandmother, yes. they all lost. And what I'm seeing my kids are going to lose that time as well. Mm -hmm. And they I are. don't, I don't have the ability to let that be. Mm -hmm. I'll lose my time, but I'll be damned if my kids are going to lose that time. That's right. That's right. So it's... the work that these young people are doing is important. It is critical. And it's critical that the people who've come before them don't, don't chastise them get in there with them and work with them and where they want to take something from you, let them take it. And where they don't, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. Yes. But they're doing work to stop this eating of time. And they're doing it boldly, differently. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of watching them and supporting them. And it's no different than when we were in school and we had apartheid going on and mm -hmm. we protest apartheid schools and colleges and businesses that supported that and and like you said I am a man and you know I'm black and I'm proud mm -hmm. and you know we've all gone through these stages but it's it's enough is I think this last four years having the president that we've had where it says it's okay to come out and be a racist it's okay to show yourself, I don't think people were expecting that. And it became exhausting for me. And Kathy and I talked about this before. It became exhausting when our white friends wanted to say, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. I don't see color. Um, I don't, un you know, help me to understand. It's like, why do I have to explain this to you? <laughs> And I'm sure you got a lot of that mm -hmm. at the Capitol. You know, I don't oh, understand, I, I Gary. Time. I got I got in trouble, uh, and <laughs> the New Haven Independent picked up on it for telling <laughs> for telling white people. And this is the quote: I'm, I'm, I think I was 41 at the time. I'm a 40 or 41 year old black man. And I'm tired of white people telling me the things I see with my own eyes isn't real. Um, <laughs> and that got me into a world of trouble. <laughs> I was like, but it's just the truth, right? It's just the truth. Like, we, we have experience and they're like, oh, you know, what, what, what I did, what, nobody's talking about you. Mm -hmm. Stop centering yourself in things that aren't about you. I don't center myself in the middle of issues that women have because that's inappropriate. I don't center myself in the issues of people with certain disabilities because that's inappropriate. But when it comes to race, white people will quickly center themselves in our issues. It's the same thing you see when I did the um, yes. disability bill. You, if you watch that debate, that 10 and a half hour debate, you watch people over and over say, but I'm, that doesn't happen in my community. Well, okay, great, good for you. <laughs> this isn't about that. Thank you. And it doesn't have to be about that. And sometimes you just need to recognize this is a place where you close your mouth and you listen. And people were offended by me saying that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't ever close your mouth, if you don't ever uh, stop thinking that everything is about you, then how can you hear other people? How can you understand mm -hmm. that they have issues? Mm -hmm. And that's the problem we have. Well, what about me? It's not about you. And when it's your turn, I'll be there to support you. That's what I do. The problem is, why don't you support me? Why don't you stand up for me? And that's what I think is so powerful about what we saw this summer. Because in places where you don't see people protest about anything, you saw even white folks get up and be like, oh, not, not, not this time. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. That was a powerful, powerful thing. I mean, and 
Suffield, Connecticut. They don't protest over anything. They have uh, listen. Black Matter rallies, right? <laughs> <laughs> I saw places protesting all over the world, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, and it was about it's about time yeah. um, that the time is now and, and people really had to check themselves. And our friends who walked quietly next to us became exposed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about it on our last podcast that, you know, on social media, I've had to unfriend some people. Um, because they they expose themselves and it's like this is this friendship is not going to work. Yeah. Uh, certain topics we can't talk about. But Gary, you're pretty well known. Your face is well known <laughs> throughout the state. You know, in Haven. <laughs> now I know when you go out sometimes, and Kathy, this is for you also. When you go out sometimes, sometimes you just want to be. You just want to be Gary, or mm -hmm. you just want to be Kathy. Um, when you go out. And you're just trying to be Gary. You're trying to be, you know, black man at a cookout. I'm with my wife. I'm, I'm dad. I'm, I'm, I'm husband. And someone always tries to get you into. I see your face. Someone always pushes that. That makes the senator come out. And how do you find that balance? And how do you? I'll start with you first. How do you find that balance to say, not today. I just want to be Gary, or I just want to be dad, or I want to be with my wife. What do you do? Um, there's, there's not a way to do what, do what I'm doing and, and have a real balance. Um, mm. there, there just isn't. Um, I am very much attuned to the fact that people have issues in their lives that can't wait for, for my period of comfort to be over. Um, and I know not everybody does this job that way, but I am keenly aware of where I was when I was a child. And I don't mean just location wise, I mean, in terms of where I sat in the society, in terms mm -hmm. of what I had and didn't have. And I'm aware that policy has a lot to do with why that existed. And I think when people make choices to do things, those choices don't all mean the same thing. When I made a choice to do the work that I'm doing, it meant that I would never, I would never forget those things, those, found, those foundational things for me. And so when people approach me, sure, I mean, there are times when I would like to be like, I'm like shopping, right? like, <laughs> a toilet paper in the, in the cart. And by the way, I have ice cream and it's gonna melt, you know, but I don't. Um, and if people need that, that's that's what I give. My 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 wife will tell you. I go shopping, and we know it's going to be two hours at least, um, because that's just what it is. And that doesn't matter what I go in for. Um, okay. And and it's it's just I don't. I used to think that I was going to figure out this balance thing, um, and everybody's been telling me since I started, you got to figure out a different way to do it. And I'm like, well, you know what? I I feel like I'm I'm <laughs> I'm getting some things done that need to be done. So. I'm going to keep doing it this way. And I just don't necessarily need to have the space to still be able to enjoy things. I mean, mm. I wake up in the morning and this is, maybe this is just the difference. I wake up in the morning and the fact that my toes feel, I have a carpet in my bedroom. The fact that my toes feel the, the difference in the fibers of the carpet say to me, I'm alive. And I'm like, that's great. And I, I don't just say I'm great, but like I sit in it for a minute, right? Okay. And it allows me to find joy, which is the internal part, not the happiness, the external thing, but right, joy in things mm -hmm. that people are missing. And so I don't need that. I'm energized. I'm energized by doing, I get to do this work. Somebody else okay. isn't doing, I'm doing this work. So it's not a burden. It's actually a joy. So I, I don't, I don't balance it like that. I thought I would, but I don't. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and Kathy, my question be for you, because we know that you have a daughter who's autistic. And how do you, when when people ask you a lot, sometimes you just want to be Kathy. You mm -hmm. want to be out. You just want to be mom. You want to be a um, um, wife. And do you always have to talk about the fact that you have a daughter who's autistic if they ask you about your children? 
if they ask me about it, I think just in that in that initial question, I don't think that it it, it may come up. But um, you know, it's a little different for me because while Gary chose his profession, um, I I didn't choose to have a daughter that's autistic. Um, but this is there was a purpose while why I was chosen for this, and so I try to re- remember that you children with autism don't always have a physical attribute that tells you that they have um, autism, but when people start to notice it, uh, they will. And some people are uncomfortable about talking about it or they'll kind of look at me. And um, but there's other people that have approached me because of the how our daughter is now so social compared to really where she came from. So she grew into this, you know, wonderful young woman. But it was a journey for us. And a long time ago. Uh, she didn't start talking, and Nodell, you know this, she didn't start talking until she was four, and no one would ever know that now because she talks all the time. Um, <laughs> so, but there was a time when I remember her sitting, and, and even when she started talking at four, it was very broken English. You know, It was like a child learning to speak. And so she, I remember one time she was sitting on my lap, and I was wearing my glasses, and she was saying to me, Mommy, I see me in your eyes. And tears just came, tears just came. Because what that said to me was that however I look at her, that's how she's going to see herself. And so if I look at her with pity um, and treat her as a child with a disability, then that's how she's going to see herself. And so early on, we made that decision that no, while she may not achieve all that her older brother has achieved, we still have expectations of her and she understands expectations. And so no, when you get up, you have you have chores that you have to do, you have to make your bed, you, you have to fix your meals. And so, no, we're not doing all of that for you. Because, you know, I've shared with her, you're not living here with me for forever. <laughs> and so you're, here's daddy's credit card. So someday, sooner rather than later, here's his credit card, go find an apartment. But, um, you know, so, but I also think that in our community, there's, there's fights on this as well, because as Gary shared, you know, we have an obligation. And so I share my story because I think until people started noticing some of the things that we were doing in terms of getting her connected to services and, and getting her in the right schools, people started asking questions about that. And and we don't share this story because I think there's uh, that that old crabs in the barrel type of adage in our community mm-hmm. that, well, if I tell, oh, if I tell Odell, then my child's not going to get the services because it's services won't be there. No, that's not the fight. The fight is that if there's not enough services, then Odell and I need to work together to ensure that there's enough services for our children because they, mm-hmm. they need it. They're, um, uh, they should they should have it right, and so that's where the fight comes in. That and so I'm I'm okay with having that conversation. I think it's other people that get uncomfortable about approaching us to have that conversation. And and Gary, thank you too. And I appreciate you being there for Odell on that day that she had a really difficult time uh, in the park. Um, because I know Odell, and I don't, I don't, I don't think I've ever asked you this question. Now I pick a podcast to ask you this question. <laughs> you always do that. <laughs> I always do that, right? Yeah, she, she, she's good for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it just somebody just said something to me the other day, and I was thinking about you, and I said, I wonder how Odell asked this question. But when when people get in a conversation with you and say, "How many children do you have?" How does that impact you? What's your response to that? Um, in the beginning, when Jonathan was first murdered, I had to say two, uh, because if not, I felt like I was forgetting about him and I could not forget about him. And, you know, how old are they? And then it goes into the conversation where one was murdered. And then after a while, depending on the settings that I'm in, I don't want to have that conversation. I just want to I, I want to break from being traumatized. Mm-hmm. I want to break from having to talk about my pain because I know the tears are going to come. So then I started saying, I'm a mother. I have a daughter and a granddaughter. And then true to form, someone will say, didn't you want to have any more children? And it's like, oh, gee, here we go. And then I still have to tell that story. So now after four years, 
I started interruptions and interruptions is my voice. It is my voice of not being ashamed of talking about mothers who have lost their children through a traumatic interruption and are going through some type of mental health illness that they haven't recognized. And they're struggling in their faith and their culture and within themselves, and they're just doing more harm than good. So now I'm always on. Mm -hmm. So now interruptions and I, now I can talk about it without being teary eyed. And I can easily say I'm a mother of a murdered son and this is my journey. Cause now it's, what do you do for a living? Right. You know, are you, are you still working here? Are you still working there? And that's why I work for myself now. You know, I, I, this is, this is what has, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. This is my advocacy. This is my voice. And Gary, I, totally agree with what you said it's not it chose me and i can't turn it on or off i'm always listening and when i'm listening to someone who's struggling and talking about what they're going through that you know it's seeping out because their trauma is seeping out mm -hmm. i can see it and i can't just be odell so I have to be, I have to be on, I have to have that conversation. But there are times where I try to leave the Reverend Odell, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and it's like, no, I can have a glass of wine, but aren't you a Reverend? <laughs> That's when she comes over here. That's when she comes in my house. <laughs> so it's, I'm always, and I, it's, I'm always on now. Gary, I appreciate you sharing that you are a man of faith and that you recognize when when you're hearing a calling, just as Odell shared. Um, what would you say to young people now or anyone? Anyway, I don't want to just say young people, but to anyone, right? To anyone that has aspirations in being involved in politics, because here, here's the key, right? Not everyone, not everyone's meant to be a senator and not everyone's meant to be a reverend, but you have a gift. And so how do you have that conversation with, with people? Yeah. Um, normally what what the people that I normally are I'm speaking to are young people who are um, involved in the kind of stuff we were talking about earlier. Uh, and normally they're not looking to be involved. But for those who, and I'm going to speak about that too, um, but uh, for those who are looking to be involved I, and coming to me saying, well, tell me how to do it. First I tell them is that's, that's not my story. So I can't tell you that story. <laughs> um, but then I tell them that because, uh, you know, I've done, quite a few notable things and people usually talk about that. And I tell them, well, those things didn't happen because uh, I was looking to be noticed or uh, looking to do the big thing. I just wanted to go and help. And I didn't even know what that meant. I just wanted to help. Um, and I listened to people and then I discovered that I have a lot of trauma in my life. And I discovered that that trauma could be put to good use. That trauma could be used to, to tell stories. That trauma could be used to break down people who think they have power. Um, and if you're not going into it for that, I don't know what you're going into it for. And I would advise you not to do it. Um, so that that's normally the kind of advice I give to those people. But to the to the young people who don't want to go in, what I and I'm, here I'm talking about black kid, black people, right? Young black people. Um, what I tell them is, you better reconsider that. Because the people who are making the decisions, the people who are creating a context in which you get to make the decisions and creating a context in which you get to sometimes not have all of the choices, they don't understand what you've been through. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what your life is. They don't understand why you would think the way you think. They don't understand almost anything about you. Um, and I'm concerned about the way that politics works. And the mm -hmm. way it works to oversimplify it is there's someone with the door and we have to keep knocking on the door, hoping they open the door. And my thing is like, I'm tired of like hoping they open the door. I want to open the door myself. And so what I'm telling them is many of the young people will tell me if I were in there, I would do it this way. I'm like, good, let's test that out. Right. Let's see what you would do. Right. And hopefully myself and others are around you to make sure that what you're saying is true. Cause if what you're saying is true, 
then things are going to be different. Because I know darn well I went in and I was like, we want to do some different stuff, and we have, right? And and that's that's where I come from because I think it's important to get those voices in. I, I encourage right. young people who don't come with the background that says politics to get in. I don't come with that background, mm. right? I come from the single mother, drug addict, father. The whole like, if you, if you got the issue, I got the issue. I got a sex sex assault on me in my background. I got if you got the issue, I got the issue. And that but that means that you see the world differently, and that's important. It's not important that my father and grandfather were legacy and that uh, I come from money and all of that. That just means that you have probably a much more limited scope of the world. Um, we need diversity of. Uh, experience and 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 I want to help bring those young people in that's and that's great. that's good you know in the church we have a we have a program that's we have a yeah we, we have a program called the spiritual gift workshop and people take the the work they take the assessment they learn about their spiritual gifts and at the end of the assessment it tells you you know what area of ministry you should serve in some people like Kathy don't like their answers and they try to change them. And God says, no, this is what you're going to be. This is, you, this is you it. You were not supposed to tell that. <laughs> you know? And, but there are some people who get this gift assessment and it says that you have the gift of being a pastor mm -hmm. and they automatically see themselves in the pulpit and they forget that there's other ways of leading and teaching the gospel and the biblical teachings versus being in the pulpit. So when someone comes at you, Gary, and they say, I want to go into politics because they can coordinate um, a rally. They can get people to follow them, but they just don't have what it takes to be in politics. They're just meant to, unfortunately, be where you are and where you are is good, but you, you're not meant to be the a mayor <laughs> or to be a legislator. What do you say to that person? How do you help redirect their their passion? Well, the first thing I do is I, I check myself because um, sometimes we're too quick to assess that a person can't do it. So I will tell you that while I may have stood on stage once in front of 15,000 people for Bernie Sanders and gave a speech, there was a time where I couldn't give a speech to three people, right? So <laughs> there, there's a lot of growth that a human being can do. Okay. Um, but I, I, I think it's, it's interesting that you bring out your point because uh, throughout my life, people have told me that, um, oh, you, you should be in ministry. And I'm like, but if you mean the pulpit, that's not my ministry, right? Um, and I think that we have to help people to see the possibilities that exist. Uh, politics is a, a big thing. It's not just elected office. Um, it is elected office, it's advocacy, it's the work to put people in the office. It's the thinking that, that some of these think tanks do. It's a lot of stuff. And so what I try to do with young people who seem currently not to be the person who should be elected is to get them to recognize that you can help out in many ways. And the best way for you to help out is to figure out what talent you actually have and not try to fit your round self into that square hole, right? Because that's not going to work and you're not really going to help people. And the other thing is just to give them some of the lessons I've learned. You know, look, um, you know, it's Black History Month, and I, I just want to say that there have been a lot of people who've come through, our people who've come through who are angry and carry the history right up in front of them, and they want to tell people what it's about. And my thing to them has been, like, I get you. I feel the same exact way, trust me, <laughs> on almost every day. But if I go to bed and I feel good about telling you what it was and nobody got help, what did I do? And so I think those are the things that I wind up doing. I wind up saying, look, you might not be fitting in here, but you can fit over here. And here are some of the things I know, because I've been all over the place doing this since I've been doing it so long. Here are some of the things I've learned, uh, mm -hmm. and I hope that you do it better than I ever did it. And anything I can do to help you, let me know. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Gary. And and so I, I just want to clean up my, my, my story that, yes, I did change some of the... <laughs> I did change some of the answers, but you know, I felt bad and I went back and, but here's the funny thing, even when I changed the answers, it came out the same way. So mm. I just want to clean that up just in case our pastor mm. is watching. 
is watching this, but I, I thought that my spiritual gift should have come out administration first, um, but it came out discernment first and then administration. Mm -hmm. And when I met with my pastor, he said, well, sister, he said, if you're going to be a good administrator, shouldn't you have a great sense of discernment with the people mm -hmm. that you're going to be working with or on the projects? And I was like, oh, OK, that makes sense. <laughs> So I, I just want to straighten that out. Um, but <laughs> okay, Gary, clean that up. Clean it up, clean it up, clean it up. Um, Gary, so looking back, and you, you shared so much with us, um, looking back, do you think there is anything that you could have done to prepare you for where you are today? I, I don't think you can prepare for, for the, the work that I'm doing. I mean, I think you do become prepared from your experiences, but I don't think you, you can just actively go out there and, and go through some course, right, and, and, and be prepared. Um, you know, look, I, I talk about the fact that I have uh, traumas in my background. How do, you, how, do you, how do you prepare? How do you add those into your background, right? And, and those, those come into to play in unexpected moments. I remember many years ago now, uh, I was sitting in a Judiciary Committee hearing and we were talking about sex assault and i had never told anybody i had uh you know when i was a child i had someone assault me um and i remember watching uh some people who you, i could tell were victims of sex assault as the conversation was going on um and the catholic church was there presenting to us because they were involved in this conversation and the, the attorney was so flippant and dismissive of these people and you could see the pain etched across their faces and it is only because I had the experience, I know the feeling that I said stuff that I've never said before publicly. But what it did in that moment, you could, you could watch them just sit there like, somebody's speaking up for us, right? Uh, how do you prepare for that? You, you don't prepare for that. You know, I, <laughs> this moment that we're going through now with all of the craziness going on, and I don't, I don't know if you've seen, but I've gotten a lot of death threats recently, right? Um, well, the, the fact that I've spent my life the way that I've spent it, uh, first time I got a death threat was 24 years ago. So, like, I don't react the way that you would normally re you would normally think people would react, and that allows me to keep doing work. But what I'm saying is, sure, you can go study politics like I did in school. You can uh, think that you know what it, but you, if you're going to do this job in a way that you center people mm -hmm. and their experiences and they matter, I don't know how you prepare for it except mm -hmm. to be open to be loving and to want to do it for the reasons that I think you should be doing it, which is for the benefit of people. Okay. Gary, when you spoke up at that hearing, and I know that's something that, you know, that is disrupting the silence we talk about, that's something that you keep to yourself, where we're, we're taught to <laughs> don't talk about it, keep it to yourself, mm -hmm. deal with it. How did you get, if you don't mind sharing, because someone, is going to hear you and has gone through that and is going through it how are you getting through that as a as a man knowing that that's something that you're not supposed to talk about and you never heal if you don't talk about it yeah um listen i have a lot of uh a lot of years in my life of not being healed if you will from all kinds of things and um I don't know how to, I don't know how to tell people how to do this. What I know is this: um, that the things that I was ashamed of, that I was like, I can't let people know, are the things that have made me extremely powerful, and mm. it have made me um, not just powerful for myself because I'm more powerful as a person than I was before I started expressing. Um, I mean, it was a time when I couldn't express any emotion but anger, um, but also powerful in the fight to help others um and and i wouldn't trade that for the world and i wish that maybe 20 years earlier i knew that and i wasn't hiding and and and, and covered in all of the, the the stuff that i learned as a child about what it is to be a black man and all of this stuff that just isn't real uh and and i'm also very thankful that i've, I've come to a place where i'm doing differently uh, before i engage with children in my life uh, so that I don't pass that on to them, but I don't know. I don't know what the secret is, except to say that for me, it came about because I couldn't watch other people be in pain. Um, yeah. And and I knew that 
even though I was still afraid of speaking certain truths, I sat in a position where if I spoke those truths, people would have to listen. They couldn't dismiss me like they dismissed other people. And I couldn't live with myself having that opportunity and not taking it. So. And that's, thank you. And that's why Kathy and I started this podcast, you know, Interruptions. Mm -hmm. And our voices, we talk about what we're not, what we're not supposed to, what's not tradition, you know, keep it to yourself, uh, don't explain it, but we have to, you know, this, the, this pain of losing my son the way that I did to murder, um, innocent, is painful. Mm -hmm. And to talk about it, to try to find a way to talk about it, to help others to heal, to hear themselves, find themselves, and to find a way to heal themselves is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, before we go, I know our time is coming down. We can't let you go without asking you about COVID. <laughs> <laughs> COVID in Connecticut, Gary. Yeah. Uh, what, 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 is, what is the question? Because COVID is big. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's ask you from the perspective of being a dad. Yes. Are, are your children um, at home doing homeschool? or? So um, the way my house works, we have a one that will be 21 in a couple of days. Uh, she's working um, and a college student. So she's in and out of the house. And, you know, it's a little difficult because she wants to be moving around like a 21 wants to, and I want to bring her neck. Uh, <laughs> and then we have a 15 year old and he, he goes to school at home, at home right now. Um, okay. So, uh, and then we have the two two year olds uh, and they're, they're here with me. Um, learning ABCs and stuff like that. Uh, so, yeah, you know, and so we've been mostly insulated from that because of the way school has worked out. Major concern with my wife, who's a CNA, uh, who went to work every day, right? Um, but in terms of the children, we've largely been been fine and uh, we haven't had any blips there. Okay, um, right. But, you know, there's, there's a concern, right? Like, I, I still have to go out from time to time and Every time I step out the door or my wife comes in, you know, there was a concern about did we bring something into the house? And um, also, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, it's not just that. It was, it was about like an existential thing. Like, did we bring something in not just to give to the kids, but did we bring something in that might um, be an issue for us? Because what happens to the kids, That's right? Good. Especially yeah. the two younger ones. So um, COVID has been a lot, uh, you know, and I'll just say this. I know we're running low on time. It's been a lot also because as a person who wants to help, hearing everybody's issues and having very little you can do about it, uh, where normally you can do a lot about people's issues, mm -hmm. it is a difficult thing. You know, you just basically, for, for the, especially in the beginning, you just sat there and took it all in and apologized for not being able to come up with an answer. That's a tough thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank Gary, you. we know that the vaccine is coming to Connecticut, is here. What do you want to say to Connecticut residents about taking the vaccine? I, I want to say to people that you, you should educate yourself about the vaccine. Know what it is you're taking. Uh, you know, I've, I've been getting debates with people who were telling me about the vaccine. They didn't want to get COVID. I'm like, that's not how this vaccine works. It's a protein, right? Like, it, But whatever you want to do. I think you should engage in learning what this vaccine is. I will put it out there. I will take the vaccine when it comes to me, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not going to castigate someone who doesn't. I just, I just think it's important that you know why you are not taking it or are taking it, um, and you understand how this thing works, and you understand that it's not the COVID uh, virus that you're getting put into you. Um, and there's probably not a difference in the size of the microchip than one vaccine versus the other, like I heard somebody uh, suggest. Um, that's a little, you know, levity, but like, make sure you, you've, you've investigated this, not from your buddy who's telling you what he knows and he talked to his buddy, but you go and do your own research on it because uh, it really is about whether you are here to uh, be upset about the vaccine or not later, right? It, it's really a question of, are you going to be alive? And we've seen enough people die. And I'm yes. hoping we're all, when we make that decision, uh, thinking about the implications of making whatever it, the wrong decision is would be for yourself. 
Thank you. Thank you. So, Gary, thank you again so much for being with us on this podcast. I think Odell did a wonderful job of sharing with you why we actually do our podcast. And we'll continue to discuss the impact of trauma. But we also know that there's a time where we need to move forward towards healing. And I think um, just hearing your message uh, today, we know that that is exactly what we encourage people to do. Because our podcast is for anyone who needs to hear the message. If you, if anyone is experiencing trauma, we encourage them to seek the help of a professional or a counselor and to talk about their issues because it is difficult when you have to readjust your life journey. So today's podcast was the first part of our celebration of Black history. So again, thank you. And what better way to kick it off but with you, Senator, Hol- Senator uh, Winfield. I hope that by hearing your story that other people will feel encouraged and renewed. And if they are not already involved in their community, that they find a way to get involved just by simply starting with something you're passionate about or an idea. Uh, We will continue, Gary, because we know that you're not gonna stop here. So we're gonna continue to watch you grow in your political arena and also know always that we will be praying for you. Um, And we encourage you, we encourage you today to try and find not just that moment when your feet are touching the carpet and you feel like you have carpet, (laughs) but also to encourage you to somehow to find that downtime for yourself, even if it's just for 30 minutes, because that's important to keep yourself renewed as well. And to our audience on our next podcast, we will feature Mrs. Dory Dumas. She's the first African-American woman president of the New Haven NAACP. And uh, we will be excited. And also, also, did I, do I need to say it, Odell? Also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. (laughs) (laughs) So to our audience, remember to like our YouTube channel and spread the word because someone you know needs to hear this. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget to click on the subscribe button and the like and share this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Hang on, Gary.